You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 61, with special guest David Barnett. I'm your layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Mike Kaiser. How are you, Mike? Very good. Very good. good. Excited to have Dave on. Yeah, we're our second interview, so this is going to be fun. Yeah, well, let's just jump right into it. Dave, you're there, I, I trust? Yep, I'm here. Okay. I'm going to do what we did with Ron uh, Johnson, essentially. Uh, if we could start out by sort of you uh, introducing yourself uh, to the audience, you know, who, who you are, what you do, and then how you got tangled up with me. <laughs> you know, how, you, how you got drawn into this mess, you know, this all this divine counsel mess, just a little, a little recapturing of, of the history here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so my name is David Burnett. I'm a teaching pastor at Arthur City Baptist Church in Texas, and I am finishing my MATBS thesis in Old Testament interpretation, and I have a BA in biblical studies. And I met Mike years ago. What, how long has it been now, Mike? Eight years ago? It's it's, it's pushing 10, so eight sounds yeah, right. Yeah, about nine years ago, I guess. Um, it was in my undergrad. And I had taken a class on Jewish apocalyptic literature, canonical and non-canonical, with um, Dr. Daniel Street, who's now at HBU. And um, we were getting into the hierarchy of angels, and I was getting really excited and in- interested in it and hearing all kinds of weird things I'd never heard before. And I was uh, asking him, what are the best um, scholars um, on this issue? And he says... Um, that he thinks the best background for this is the divine council in the Old Testament, and he sent me to Mike's website. And so I got on Mike's website, and I was enthralled. I read just about every. I literally read everything on his website, and and I was just that that was it and so that year was my first year to go to ETS, uh, the Evangelical Theological Society, and. Mike was giving a paper on the ancient Israelite Godhead, and uh, he was the chair of that session. And um, I was really excited to meet him and hear his paper. And so I went to his paper and listened and had uh, some questions afterwards and was getting excited and introduced myself to Mike after the session and said, you know, I've read everything on your website. I've been thinking about these things. I'm making all these connections. What about this text? What about this text? And Mike's excited that I'm excited and and uh, <laughs> met Ron Johnson. Someone's paying think. attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And Ron Johnson was there and uh, met him. And then we all had dinner that evening. And uh, I got to hang out with you guys and your wives. And it was a great dinner. And just kind of told the story of where I've come from and where they've come from. And just, man, we've just been talking about text and interpretation ever since. Well, I, I, you know, I, again, I have good memories of that too. I mean, it, you know, we can joke about it. I mean, Dave wasn't the only one to come to hear the paper. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so, sometimes, you know, you, you get the impression that things are, can be so obscure or since as my listeners, of course, know, you know, this isn't the, the, the kind of thing that you'd encounter on the normal beaten path uh, within evangelicalism that, uh, you know, I often get email, am I the only one, you know, is are other people really, you know, tell me, you know, confirm to me that other people are really interested in this. And they are, you know, they, they, they come out of the woodwork, you know, they hear something and they pursue it. They have, they have the passion for it. They see the value of it. And, you know, Dave's a good example of that. It just happened to be at an academic conference. So yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a familiar story, but obviously one I have a, a real you know, good memory of as well. What, um, if you can sort of elaborate on kind of your journey since that point, uh, what, you know, after, after we met and after, you know, again, you started really pouring yourself into this, you, you began to develop, you know, your own research interests. So if you right. could describe some of those yeah. for people, I think they'd find it very interesting. So yeah, I came kind of came at this topic through the back door. I was really into uh, the study of Paul, and I got into the new perspective in my undergrad and began to really get into Jewish backgrounds and uh, read a lot of apocalyptic literature and a lot of you know you know the weird apocalypses of heavenly journeys and and revelations and all these things and. Uh, 
begin to see that this was kind of a long developed idea that has had lots of reception history to it and started making the connections with the divine council stuff to the to the apocalyptic stuff and then into the new testament and uh, in paul i was studying romans and i was reading romans 4 and um just reading over what paul has to say about the abrahamic um covenant the way he reads it and he he mentions in 413 that the promise to Abraham and his seed is that he would be heir of the cosmos and i'm thinking to myself i don't remember that in genesis and <laughs> uh, so where is paul or, or, or sunday school right? <laughs> yeah i don't uh abraham promised the cosmos i remember him promised the land of israel and the multiplication of seed but i don't remember him being promised the whole cosmos and um so i that made me dig and and you know paul's connecting all sorts of ideas in romans 4 there that he reads all out of genesis 15 and it and it made me start this kind of research path where where are all these ideas coming from and just so happens that the divine counsel piece or element to this um interpretation of genesis 15 i found when i wasn't really looking for it i just it just kind of i stumbled upon it and realized that you know in the old testament um and in which is common in ancient near eastern literature is this whole concept of uh the stars as the astral hosts as the heavenly hosts or the um, even called the sons of God, and it's this common idea in the ancient world that the the stars, as we would call them, stars. Uh, Kolkavim in Hebrew probably just means uh, shining ones or burning ones. Um, I, I just translate them as celestial bodies in my in my research. But it, those they are actually beings in the heavens in their cosmology. And and important uh, to that idea is I found in Deuteronomy is that Deuteronomy uh, Deuteronomy four especially. Especially, um, I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of the Deuteronomy 32 stuff because I've heard yep. y'all talk about that. But specifically, that language in Deuteronomy 32 is in Deuteronomy 4 as well in the passage of uh, about Anikonism where Yahweh is telling Moses not to make any graven images, um, not of man, woman, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens. And then it, he says, look to the heavens and see all the sun, the moon, the stars. And he calls them all the Savaot, all the hosts of heaven. He says, don't be carried away and worship them, those that were allotted to the peoples under the whole heavens. Mm -hmm. And that was, I didn't know what to do with that text. <laughs> I, I was like, is this in my Old Testament? Because I don't remember hearing about this text. Yeah, it's, it sounds like, a, you know, like Psalm 82 was sort of a watershed. Oh yeah, you know, passage for me. So this is where you're tracking. Yeah, this. Well, I had already been exposed. This was post being exposed to Mike's work in the Deuteronomy 32 worldview and connecting it with Psalm 82. But then when I looked through Deuteronomy and I studied, I wanted to study Deuteronomy more and kind of understand the Shema in relation to these ideas. Understand uh, Deuteronomy's understanding of the gods of the nations and how Deuteronomy articulates them and. It, what was interesting was in Deuteronomy 4, you have this language of of halak or allotment um, to of the peoples that comes up in 32. But in Deuteronomy 4, it's talking about the astral host, the sun, moon, stars. Mm -hmm. And so where in Deuteronomy 32 is the sons of God. And then in yeah. 17, of course, you have the mention of the gods of the nations, uh, gods that were not allotted to you. And so... This this trajectory led me back into this whole idea connected with Genesis 15, when the word of Yahweh takes Abram outside in a vision. It's very important. This is a vision sequence and takes him outside and shows him the stars and says, number the stars. If you can number them, so shall your seed be. And in this promise, what I found, and this was completely accidental, I wasn't really looking for it. I assumed that somewhere in there, Paul is reading that promise as the, being promised to be like the heavenly hosts, to, to be like the stars in the sense of qualitatively, not just quantitatively. Mm -hmm. And so that I had a hunch that I was right about this, and I started uh, digging through the second 
uh, temple material. And lo and behold, I found multiple readings of that in the second temple period, as I had suspected uh, in Philo, in Apocalypse of Abraham, more than likely in Sirach, the Greek reading of Wisdom Ben Sira. Um, so I'm finding in these texts this tradition of reading it that way. So for texts from, from, from Palestinian apocalypses to Alexandrian philosophers. Uh, so it's, it seems to be a wide-ranging tradition of reading the text this way, and it, and it lined up perfectly with this whole divine council tradition. And uh, it, I was fascinated, and I ended up writing a paper uh, on it and uh, submitting it for a conference um, at HBU on Paul and Judaism last year, and it was accepted. And I presented it there, and it got great feedback and uh, sparked some great conversations. And uh, immediately after, um, I had I had submitted the paper to SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature, for the national meeting in San Diego. When I first submitted it, it was rejected. And uh, the Pauline Epistles section is a difficult section to get accepted into. And so I, yeah. was, I wasn't, you know, I was expecting that. But then I got an email a few days later where they said uh, that they were going to, because of the amount of great um, submissions that they had, they were going to open a second session and it was going to be a joint session with all the Pauline Epistles groups meeting together. And uh, it was going to be a panel session where they have three respondents. And uh, so uh, they said, if you'd like to resubmit, you can. And of course I did, not expecting to uh, for it to be accepted, you know, because I haven't even started my PhD yet. I figure they're probably not going to let a student member present on this, but I guess it had got enough traction and some folks heard about it and they ended up accepting it. And uh turns out the the readers, the respondents to my paper there at SBL were um N.T. Wright, uh Pamela Eisenbaum and Ward Blanton. And uh it went over really well. Um and I, yeah. I, I was there for you know, I mean it uh we we ought to get into that a little bit because Ron yeah, I don't know if you listened to the interview with Ron. Yeah. You know, Ron made the observation that uh you know, how much he appreciates N.T. Wright. And I think we all appreciate uh, N.T. Wright and, you know, Absolutely. what he's produced. But, you know, Ron's, he had this little element of frustration. If N.T. Wright only knew about the Divine Council worldview, this part of his argument over here would be strengthened and would help him address, you know, certain things that he's been criticized for. And, and that actually was how I felt listening to your paper and his response to your paper, because it became evident to me really quickly that he just did not have the framework of the Old Testament framework to really process what you were saying. And and I was pleasantly surprised. I don't you can you can tell us if you were surprised by this, but I was pleasantly surprised that you had there were, there were probably three or four you know people in the audience that just chimed in right away uh, in your defense uh, in, you know, in the Q&A. Yeah, I actually, you know, Mike, the whole. Th that whole SBL experience was kind of backwards for me, actually, because I had, you know, I had been really interested in the in the study of uh, theosis in Paul for quite some time. The idea of deification, that the promise uh, goal of sanctification in Paul was the idea of becoming like God or like the gods, and I had read a lot of great literature on this. Um, and but I I saw no one making these connections with the Old mm -hmm. Testament, so. I'm thinking, uh, you know, that Wright was going to be my biggest proponent because he's uh, he he supports the idea of theosis in Paul. And I thought that um, by bringing the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern framework to bear on the conversation, that it would only, you know, highlight those ideas and give them the depth of background that I think is actually where Paul's deriving these ideas, along with other Second Temple Jews. And so um, I expected him to be all for it, while I wasn't too sure about um, Eisenbaum and Blanton. I thought I might get some uh, pushback from them. And it was quite the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I remember uh, Pamela Eisenbaum uh, very kindly saying that uh, I had convinced her um, that this is how Paul was reading it. And she told me afterwards that um, this is something that needed to be published and Pauline scholars need to deal with this because they just, no one's talked about this. And so um, I had mentioned to her that uh, the paper has been solicited for the Journal of Study of Paul and his letters. And so I'm just waiting to hear back from the editorial board about that to see what um, mm -hmm. what journal it'll come out in. But then, yeah, like you said, at, during the Q&A time, 
uh, well, just leading up to that, Wright had actually pushed back and had disagreed with my premise. And, you know, in kind and polite British fashion, uh, <laughs> saying that it was an ingenious proposal, but I just disagree with your premise. And, and, uh, he was he was of the persuasion. And the, the, the contention is really important here, though. His contention was that I was mistaking metaphor with metonymy and um, that the astralization passages that um, – um, you're well aware of Mike in Second Temple period, uh, as they relate to resurrection, um, say in texts like First Enoch and and Second Baruch, etc. Th- these texts that read the the resurrection in astral terms coming out of Daniel 12, you know, that in the resurrection, they will shine right. as the stars of heaven. Um, there's, there's a wide ranging tradition in the second temple period that reads it that way in apocalyptic Judaism, uh, which I would consider early Christianity within that, within those strands um, th- of reading it that way. He says that all of those texts are metaphoric that it, in his reading, especially in his resurrection of the son of God book, um, that massive tome on the resurrection, when he deals with those texts, uh, he treats them all as metaphoric readings, like, like the stars is simply a metaphor and you're mistaken, um, on this, but the, the rest of the second temple scholars, um, <laughs> were behind me on this and yeah. other Christian scholars as well. One of the, the, one of the scholars that stood up immediately to my defense was uh, Brant Petrie from Notre Dame, and um, he he pointed out in First Corinthians fifteen the language of orani or heavenly ones that's used or celestial bodies even that's used in the Old Testament yep. to talk about the celestial bodies is what Paul calls the resurrected ones. And so this language of resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15 is used, uh, uses astral terminology that would be used for the astral beings of the Old Testament and uses it for the resurrected uh, faithful. Yeah, that, so- that's, that's really tricky. You know, if you're going to if you're going to approach it like Wright does, when you start saying, well, all this is metaphorical and then that. You know, the fact of that connection in First Corinthians 15, Wright, of course, isn't going to say, well, the resurrection is, is a metaphor. I mean, he's, he's going to affirm that Paul's talking about a genuine resurrection, but then it, he's sort of trapped, you know, in that, in that assumption of his that, that this is all just metaphorical language. Well, how, how does that work? Metaphorical language, but yet you're affirming the reality of, of, of this? I mean, how explain that? You know, so it, it seems to me like he, he's boxed in there a little bit. Yeah. It it's kind of ironic to me because, uh, well, here's the part that I expected actually from him that he that he uh, responded about was he felt that um, too strong of a focus on the astralization language would be reading the resurrection as a non bodily phenomena that they would just become spirits in the resurrection mm-hmm. and it would be more of a gnostic view and not more of a this earthly kind of new creation hard fleshly type of resurrection and and so he was because he has that kind of uh, apologetic considerations it's 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 difficult to um, to talk about these issues because when you don't know when you're not bringing in the divine counsel background to this and then only looking at it from the perspective of well I have to defend the bodily resurrection um, things can get mixed up and uh, some scholars that I think are really helpful here and Wright did mention one of them briefly but in terms of the astral resurrection is still bodily is a scholar by the name of Trolls Innsberg Peterson who's done a lot of work on Paul and Stoicism and Paul and the Stoics and re- reading them comparatively, and especially Paul's cosmology and ethics, and even his ontology uh, frequently uses the language of Stoicism. And he makes a good point here. And another scholar that has a um, a book coming out that I'm really looking forward to is Matthew Thiessen at St. Louis University, who has a book coming out on Paul and the Gentile problem. And he has a whole chapter dealing with this. And he's actually cited my forthcoming article a couple of times. And I've had conversations with him about this is that they both point out that, for example, the first Corinthians 15 passage, Paul, when he talks about a, a pneumatic body, a spirited mm-hmm. body or a spiritual body, as it's translated often, he does not mean a non 
corporeal body right. or incorporeal body. He does not mean a, a floating around spirit like the way modernists think of spirit. That He's thinking that the spirit is actually substance. It's the substance of the astral beings of heaven, the gods or the angels. This is the substance that mm-hmm. they are made out of. Yeah, whatever that stuff is, that that's what we will be. Right. That's you know, what Numa is for and even. Even, you know, you know, without appealing to scholars, I mean, I can remember in my own church context, you know, hearing sermons about the resurrected Jesus. Okay, he shows up in the upper room, and apparently he just... He's just there, doesn't need to go through a door, doesn't need to knock. He's, you know, the, the old, the whole kind of, you know, passing through the walls, you right. know, sort of thing. And yet, and yet he's very corporeal. I mean, he, he, he eats after the resurrection. He yes. tells Thomas, hey, you know, put your fingers here in the holes. And I mean, so, so even in, on a popular level, this notion of corporality does not, and, and really historically, you know, hasn't been thought to conflict with this otherworldliness because that's not a normal human body. Right. You know, it doesn't have blood, you know, it so th- there's something going on there and and it it does surprise me that right if it is uh, I mean I'll use the word is sort of fearful to talk about the one aspect, the otherworldly aspect, you know, sort of uh shunting off the astral talk for the sake of affirming the corporeal talks, you know, cutting off your nose despite your face, you know, kind of thing. Right, right. Where you don't really have to make that choice. You know, so anyway, I right. And that's just what popped into my head. You know, no, that's good. Said that I well, no, I think you hit the nail on the head there because that what we what we're talking about the the Old Testament and ancient Near Eastern background for this is essential because when we think of the the nature of the gods and Paul even uses the language in in First Corinthians fifteen of perishable versus imperishable, like flesh and blood. He doesn't. That's when when Paul puts flesh and blood against spirit in some sort of like dichotomy. It doesn't mean bodily and unbodily. It means one is perishable, one isn't. Right. That's that's really all he means. Right. The perishable must be taken off. This imperishable substance is put on. And so it's not it's still substantive. It's still bodied. It's still embodied. It's still substantive. But it would but be the it's substance more than human. of the gods. Yes. Yeah. That humans in their truest resurrected glorified form are like the bodies of the gods. They are completely immortal and imperishable. Have you read um, David Lit- Litwa's uh, book on this? Uh, I've read most of it, yes. Okay, I read- he has an article and, and actually a pretty pretty lengthy chapter on this. I'm wondering if that was any help. Yeah, it was help. Um, yeah, and We Are Being Transformed, his, yeah, yeah the, the monograph that he did with Walter de Groyer, Um that, th- it was very helpful and I, I love his monograph. I think it's a, an amazing treasure trove of source material. I mean, it is, it, he's done an extensive research on deification and Paul. But mm-hmm. what I was fascinated about, and I mentioned this in the Q&A uh, at SBL, was in Litva's work not one time in his whole section on astralization does he mention the interpretation of Genesis 15. <laughs> not once. Yeah, yeah what, it is kind of amazing. And, and I was like, otherwise, I, I can sing nothing but praises about that book. But, but I, was, I was just kind of flabbergasted. I was like, well, here's – I'm looking at multiple – Jewish Greek texts right in front of me that that reference this astral reading of Genesis 15 and not one of them is mentioned and you know I I I talked to Litva briefly after that session and mentioned that to him and uh he he thought it was interesting and and hopefully I'll be able to dialogue with him more in the future but but um yeah that was fascinating to me and I'm glad the holes there cuz I'm going to fill it so <laughs> <laughs> well just you know just for the sake of the of the listener I mean the the point you know that that we're making here uh, is that if if you put if you put uh, some of these scholars in a room with Josephus and Philo and a few other people, and Josephus and Philo more or less just you know sort of shut up and l- listen to them talk about theosis and deification and all this, and they never would have heard Genesis fifteen seven. They would have butted in and said, you know, hold on, a, hold on a minute, fellas. You know, you're missing a really fundamental passage, right? And that we've talked about a lot. You know, what what gives? Why? How did you miss this? Right. And it's Genesis 15, 5. I did hear you say that on the previous podcast. 15, 5, so shall your seed be. But yeah, um, but yeah you, you, this is, I, I'm really not sure how it's missed because it really does plug up all the kind of exegetical issues with 
all of the content that Paul, for example, is packing into Genesis 15. Because there's a lot of content that in Romans 4 that a lot of exegetes have had a very difficult time explaining um, and almost seeing as kind of disparate, disconnected ideas Mm -hmm. that when Paul says that the promise to Abraham is to inherit the cosmos, he also says that he relates it to the idea of God bringing um, something out of nothing. So the whole creation idea, uh, bringing life from the dead, uh, the resurrection, and becoming the father of many nations. And he piles all of this into the content of the promise that was made in Genesis 15 to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so how do you fit resurrection in there, um, inheriting nations in there, inheriting cosmos in there, like new creation type event in there? How do you get it all in there? And uh, this, <laughs> I mean, because otherwise you're saying, man, Paul is doing some insane exegetical moves here. Um, but but if you see this piece, I think yeah. it's a missing element that a lot of scholars, because they don't really understand the divine counsel context, uh, they miss these elements. Yeah, well, you know, naturally you're preaching to the choir here. I mean, I, I would certainly agree. And, and it is you know, th- this isn't the only case. I mean, I've shared with with people in the podcast and on the blog. You know, it's 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 kind of startling what what you see seasoned scholars miss. And 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 it's not a question of you know we're smart and they're not. It's just that they're not paying attention, especially if they're New Testament or Second Temple. They right. They I mean, there's only so much time that they have to devote to whatever it is they're focused on, and, and so they don't often you know, get directed by something they read to the Old Testament and specifically to this aspect of Old Testament biblical theology. And, and even if they do, they, they don't have the luxury necessarily of camping on it, you know, and really sort of going to town on it, you know, and, and having it make a difference. But of course, you did that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's just paid off. I, I, I want to get your, your take just on a, a general question. Sure. Because I, I do get asked this question a lot. It'd be kind of interesting for people to hear what you know, what you think about it. But what is the value uh, of reading non-canonical material from the Second Temple period? In other words, if, you know, somebody in church comes up to you, and you probably have had this happen at some point, mm-hmm. you know, why why should I spend any time reading that? Uh, what Give me a reason for caring uh, as, a, as a layperson, as somebody who's not a scholar, you know, why should I sort of dive into that? Right, right. That's a really, really important question for Protestants. You know, well, for for starters, there's so many answers I want to give to this, but I'm going to try to summarize it in, in just a couple. The first one I would say is because a lot of the apocryphal literature uh, that we call is the apocrypha or deuterocanonical texts that Catholics and, and Episcopals and Orthodox still have in their Bibles were in all of the early Christian codexes. And so they were part of this literature. They predated the New Testament, and they they show the reception history of the Old Testament in the period between the Testaments, which is really not the best denotation for that period. It's not intertestamental. It's yeah. Second Temple. Um, but in that Second Temple period, it shows how faithful Jews are reading their Old Testament and interpreting it. And that reception history is really important because that's the highways leading into the New Testament. Yeah, it's so, not like the New Testament readers would have just looked at that material and said, oh, well, this is the way these guys are reading it. Let's do something totally different. Right. Because I think a lot of the kind of the lay assumption is that you you have these silent years, you know, from the end of Malachi, which is only in the Protestant, the end of the Protestant canon, um, not the Jewish canon. But um, at the end of Malachi, and then you have this great silence, and then boom, Matthew. <laughs> and yeah. and I think what happened, wh- why that's so uh, detrimental to our understanding of the New Testament often is, is we're not finding some of these concepts in the New Testament that would have been normative in the Judaisms of the period. We're not seeing it. And right. we see some of these things is unique or unexplainable, and uh, when in reality, they have a a very deep background in this literature. For example, the apocalyptic tradition, uh, a lot of the language in the New Testament of uh, revealing the righteousness of God and uh, beholding uh, Jesus enthroned in heaven and Mm -hmm. a journey to the third heavens and the whole book of Revelation, I mean, it, it kind of assumes this kind of dialectic with 
and conversation with apocalyptic literature of the day and apocalyptic genre of the day and Christianity, earliest Christianity, which I think is kind of an anachronistic term when we're talking about New Testament. But when we talk about the earliest Christianity that we see in the New Testament, this is really to be read in concert with apocalyptic strands of Judaism of the time. Um, Yeah, it's it's not like, I mean, I, I often, you know, go out to events or whatever or on the podcast, you, know, you, you get questions like, why haven't I ever heard this before? Well, a, a, a first century Jew would never say that. <laughs> exactly. You know, anyone who's literate, you know, among the, the, the earliest Christians, they would have inherited a lot of these ideas that we talk about, you know, divine counsel stuff in the Old Testament. That, that would have just been part of their frame of reference just just by default right. because you know they have this continuity you know with the old testament on into the second temple period and now we're here in the first century and we're you know we're, we're talking about you know apostles and, and the resurrected jesus and all this stuff well they would have never looked at you you know or looked at me you know if we were back there in time and, and they and said well where are you getting that why haven't we ever heard this before they would have heard it a lot Right, right. I use the common metaphor that m- many pastors use hermeneutically, but ironically don't apply it to the study of this second tip of literature, is the whole idea of someone digging up um, a letter I write to to Mike or Trey about, um, hey, you want to come to my Super Bowl party? The Cowboys are playing the Giants. <laughs> see, you know, see you later, whatever. And someone digs up that later, uh, digs up that letter 2,000 years later and sees terms like Super Bowl. And you have the, the ancient English philologist doing studies <laughs> on what Super Bowl means. And, yeah, well, the word we, super used in different contexts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we know this means very large or great in size. And we know that bowl is a kind of utensil they put food in. And so it must be a very large bowl. And we know that cowboys are these uh, figures that rode on these ancient extinct animals that have four legs called horses. And, you know, (laughs) you know, you would make all sorts of exegetical fallacies if you're if you're doing if you're reading the text that way. And so the common idioms and the norms that simply by hearing a word or an idea that all these things come to mind when we when we say the term Super Bowl, I mean, a million things flood your mind instantly. Right, because of the baggage, the yeah. norms of language. I mean, you're thinking pads, football, helmets, commercials, uh, stadiums. You're thinking all kinds of things in an instant. And we we have to – getting into that Second Temple literature isn't to say that we hold it at equal level with the canon or we think it's lost scriptures that we need to, to read mm-hmm. uh, is equal to the Gospels. It has nothing to do with that. We, we're reading that literature so that we can better understand in Jew, in Judaism – because that's what early Christianity is. It's still Judaism um, that we want to understand the norms of language of that period, the way that they are reading their Old Testaments, the way their exegetical traditions, not our own, because they're 2000 years removed. And so we, we want to understand those traditions so that we can actually hear some of these little allusions and little mentions of ideas that we may not understand or have a have a any sort of background for. And that literature helps helps us fill in a lot of those gaps. Yeah, I, I usually just tell people when I get the canon question, and I understand why you're asking, I understand why a lot of people assign importance to the question, but it, it's hard for me to even care about it because I don't I don't have to I don't have to see a book as canonical to know that it has value. Right. And and to know that it, it informed a New Testament writer. So Sure, if I get to heaven someday and God comes to me and says, Mike, you know, about about Enoch, you know, you were wrong there. That that should have been in there. You know, I'm not going to care. You know, I don't think I'm going to have that conversation. Yeah. yeah. But it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care if I did. And I don't even I don't even process the question that way. It's like I know, for instance, you know, again, taking Enoch, you know, in, in probably the most obvious connection. I know that Peter and Jude mm-hmm. read this material because it informs what they write. So that is sort of a a hint or a clue that maybe I ought to go read that. Yeah, absolutely. So I can process better, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And that goes back to the first thing I was saying about this literature is the the Peter and Jude references, I think, are really important because what they show is not only are they reading this Enochic reading of Genesis, but the, the Enochic readings of Genesis are seeing things implicitly within Genesis that we may not see. Because right. we don't have those ancient eyes. And because we might read the Enochic tradition 
and the Enochic texts like First Enoch um, and think, this is crazy. What, where are they getting all this weird giant stuff and, and, and angels teaching them alchemy? And what the heck is going on with all this? Well, and what's the connection with Sodom and Gomorrah and angels coming down? So it's interesting there. You see the connection between Genesis 6 and angels um, or heavenly beings um, having sexual relations with, with um, women and then connecting it with the Sodom and Gomorrah stories where angels are coming down and the men want to take them and know them. And, and these ancient texts are seeing these connections and reading the stories together where the narrative of Genesis itself recapitulates itself and reads these stories together. And, they, and these ancient texts help us see these kinds of connections that may be implicit in Genesis already that we may not have noticed, that they notice and they make mm-hmm. us aware of. And what you'll find is you'll find all sorts of texts uh, that are reading traditions that way. And then, you know, into the New Testament with the Peter and Jude connecting um, the Watcher's tradition with the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so it's like this, they're seeing th- literature of the Old Testament li- di- of the Old Testament differently than we are. Mm-hmm. And that's what that literature is so helpful for, is to start to begin to read the Old Testament in ways that we've never read it before. Well, that's good. I mean, it, again, I, I think the more we we try to communicate that to people, whether whether the question surfaces directly or not, I think it, you know, it is really valuable. Because again, you know, you and I have, we, we both preach this, you know, to our <laughs> respective audiences, you know, right. you know, this whole notion of, you know, don't let, let's let's do more than pay lip service to this idea of reading scripture in context. Yes. Okay. It, when we talk about context, we're not talking about evangelicalism or you know some narrow evangelical sub tradition or the Reformation or the Puritans or whatever. It, it it it's the context that produced the stuff. Right. And that to us, you know, obviously because we you know we're down this road a considerable ways. That that's that has reached the point of being a self evident thing. Right. You know, and and I'm not saying it isn't because I I sincerely think it is a self-evident thing that, you know, whatever context produced something, that's the one you need to understand to process the thing produced. That that just makes abundant sense. That's that's logical coherence at, at its simplest. But yet people again are not they're not trained to do that. Uh and so when you bring up primary sources that aren't connected to the Bible in, in at the level of inspiration. You know, you, you get, you know, people look at you like, you know, you're, you're asking me to do what? You're suggesting I read what? Yeah. You know, it doesn't make any sense to them. So I, I think it's real helpful, you know, to the way you framed it, you know, to say this helps us read a, a given text the way they would have read it and notice right. things that they noticed. And, and, and that's important because we become more like them. You know, we, we our minds become trained to process the information more closely to the way their minds would have processed it. Right. And 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 that that's how that's one of the ways, you know, we can sort of try to recover that context, you know, to have like I like to say to have the Israelite in your head. Yeah. That, that yeah. that's really what you need. Uh, let me let me ask you this. How or you know, do you and if you do, how how do you communicate not only these sorts of recommendations in terms of Bible study to the people at the church where you pastor, but are, are you able to communicate any of, of what I'll loosely refer to as uh, divine counsel worldview content in your sermons? And if you do that, how, uh, give us some examples. You know, how how have you tried to do that? Where has it worked? Where has it not worked? Uh, if you don't, you know, what's what's the hesitation? I mean, where where are you at in terms of someone who is trying to help people understand Scripture really the, the best way that they can, you know, try to put some of these things within their reach. Right. Yeah. I've actually done that quite a bit. And it's one of those things where, um, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a big, big proponent of the normativity of this, but I do teach expositionally at my church, mm-hmm. um, you know, teach through books of the Bible. And I, I think I'm not saying that every pastor should do this. I'm not out preaching a method here, but but I'm saying that I, that's, that's what I've found to be most helpful in reorienting minds into what these texts actually mean is to read the whole text in its entirety, no matter how long it takes us. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've spent 
just inordinate amount of time in these texts. And so what I've done in uh, at my church, for example, in teaching through, let's say we spent uh, about three years and two months uh, teaching through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, the reason why we spent so long in it is because every single Old Testament allusion, quotation, mm-hmm. um, important background material, we w- I would dig into and teach them about. Mm-hmm. And I, I would... T- I would really keep it in a narrative mode, keep it in a storied mode where they understand how this fits into that world. But we, in order to construct that world, we'd go back into the Old Testament text that it may be that Luke may be alluding to or or outright quoting, and read that text within its context, and then see how it's received. Sometimes in later Old Testament texts, or maybe in some inner uh, some Second Temple texts, even, and and then go back to Luke and see that. There's been a life to this text. There's been a tradition behind it. And then when you kind of, when you read the Luke text first and you don't have it, and then you go back to the beginning and read forward, I close again with that Luke text and you see these light bulbs and eyes like wide open, like, wow, all that is in there. And it's... (laughs) You know, it's it's an amazing ride and it and it's and it's eye opening. And so I take them through it kind of in a narrative mode, you know, walk them through it pastorally. And uh, the the divine counsel context has kind of been shoved in there over long periods of time. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, at some time, at some points, I would take a break and say, OK, this Sunday, we're going to look at the whole kind of background of this one idea before we go back to Luke. And I would do that. And, and so the divine counsel thing has been a constant, um, touch point or touch point that has built on over the years. And so they are probably, you know, a lot, a lot of them may know, Oh, Deuteronomy 32, that's song of Moses. I know what that is about. You know, I know what, Oh, Psalm 82. Yeah. I know what that's about, you know, and it's Mm -hmm. part of their, it's actually incorporated into the eschatology of my church and they don't, and they would even use those terms. They would just kind of know it secondarily. Like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, of course, the the demise of the powers of heaven means that the real exalted humanity gets the world back, you know. And so yeah. it's just kind of part of their um, theological toolbox. And it's in, a lot of the times implicit, sometimes explicit. But again, this is something that I have I've had to do over long periods of time. It's something that is not just dumped in your face like here's all this stuff everything you believed is nonsense you know that's <laughs> that's that's childish and a lot of i think a lot of young students who have these huge paradigm shifts just want to run in sunday school and just dump it on their people you know and and it's like you got to you got to walk people through this stuff you know they don't have the same education that you have and so you know a lot of patience and a lot of kind of building the context narratively taking your time and uh, walking them through it and even having what i've found to be really helpful with this kind of material like incorporating this material is uh, you know we in, in our church we have a sunday morning service and then a sunday evening service mm-hmm. and in some of my Sunday evening services, we do this like once a month. Sometimes uh, we'll have a Sunday evening service, which is only a Q&A time there. I won't mm. preach at all. And we'll have a wow. open Q&A on Sunday night. And you can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. And, and what a concept. Yeah. I mean, it's the I mean, the church isn't about me. It's it's about it's about the living word, you know, Christ. So and, and if I can help if we can discuss it and air some difficult questions or there was some idea and I always encourage them of this, you know, if you have a little notepad or something with you scribble down any time you have a question when I'm teaching so that when those times come up, you'll have it and you can bring it up and we'll get answers to it hopefully, or we'll just dig deeper, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been really cool and really helpful. And I have a small church, so it's easier for me to do that. You know, Mm -hmm. with a small country church of 30 people or something, it's really, simple to do that. But when you have large kind of CEO pastor driven churches where you got thousand people listening to you or watching you on a screen, you just can't do that kind of stuff. It's more of a Sunday school kind of a deal then. So, um, yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's interesting. So you, you feel, you feel good about it. Sounds like you feel good about it. This is, you, you would, would you use the word successful that your, your effort to do this on, on a local church level has been successful that you haven't had half your congregation leave and want to burn you at the stake and all that kind of stuff. Oh, no, 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 no. They, they, no, they, 
like I said, they trust me. This has been over, you know, years time easing them into this kind of thing. And I think it's been successful. But but again, I can't stress enough the patience with this. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, in the, the academic context is one thing, but the church context is a whole nother thing. And um, and so you got to be real careful and pastoral and walk people through these types of big paradigmatic ideas that kind of shift the way you look at Bible and the way you treat these texts. Um, you know, because a lot of these folks, have, some of these folks have been in church for 40 years and their theology set. And so to kind of inch them out of it and lead them out of that real slowly is, is you know, sometimes can be a painful process, you know? Yeah. So. Well, what, you know, we're, I'm going to find out a little bit you know, what this is like as far as the, uh, you know, with the release of the books, you know, we're right. not, you know, nobody knows. I mean, we can, we can sit here in, in the office and we frequently do, you know, guess as to what reaction is going to be, but you're not going to know until, until they're out there and, you know, they've got five or six months, you know, behind them and, and we'll see, you know, who loves it, who hates it and who's indifferent, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. you know, it, it, it'll, it'll develop and we'll learn something, you know, about, yeah. you know, how to, how to do something with the content. So yeah, one, one more question. Um, mm-hmm. Now you, you know, you, you mentioned your research in Genesis 15, five and uh, that, and of course that again, relating to your, your thesis and whatnot, what are some other things that sort of are on your radar that you are looking forward to diving into in relation to any, and again, anything that we would loosely call divine counsel stuff that you could see yourself jumping into and studying at some other point. Mike, the list is too long. <laughs> well, just give us, give us three long. or, get, you know, give us three or four. You know, give us yeah. that in a sentence, and then maybe a, two or three sentences of explaining what that is or why you think that's interesting. Okay, yeah, I can give a couple examples. Um, so a lot of my research um, on my own and, you know, through papers um, has been connecting these ideas in Paul, but also I want to do this more with the Gospels. So uh, just one more thing in Paul I'll mention and then something in the Gospels. Um, so in Paul, the, I want to explore more the the Romans issues and connect more. I didn't have time to do this in my paper, uh, but I want to do this further probably in my uh, dissertation is connect these ideas um, to Paul's glory Christology and the idea of glorification in Paul and that that actually being a term connected to these uh, divine counsel idea of astral glory and shining, the bright shiningness of these beings in the Old Testament and connect, understanding that the, the titles like the holy ones that they're given uh, frequently, the divine counsel in the Old Testament, mm-hmm. connect, Paul uses these titles, well, sure. holy ones, to call the community who already has the the pneuma or the pnefma, the spirit. So that they, he already calls them if they've if they're partakers of the spirit and baptized into Christ or in Christ, the, the Pauline metaphor of salvation is in Christ, not metaphor, but ontologically for him, having the spirit that you're already holy ones. Right. And so you're waiting, like, for example, in Romans 8, you're waiting on the apocalypse, the revelation of the sons of God. Um, you holy ones that I've called you before, uh, when the whole cosmos knows that you're the actual sons of God. And this is attached to glorified, the idea of being glorified. And so I think the glory language is uh, is coming off of these kinds of celestial or astral glorification ideas. Uh, and they're, that's just, this is how Paul is talking about the upcoming, well, the current and the revealing of the deification of the believer. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in the Gospels, I I found something really interesting years ago and didn't really make the divine council connection till more more recently probably in the past year or so is you know in the in the gospels you have this this title given to Jesus by the spirit beings that aren't isn't given to him by any humans and it's son son of the most high Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, you're familiar with these and we've talked about these texts before. But something very interesting about these texts is there's been an ongoing and you're familiar with this, Mike, this ongoing debate about do the synoptic gospels actually teach the preexistence of Christ? 
Right. You know? This has been a this has been a major debate for years in in modern, uh, sp- specifically Western scholarship. And and uh, Simon Gathercole a few years back tried to approach the question by suggesting uh, this is Simon Gathercole at Cambridge, New Testament scholar, tried to approach it by suggesting that the I am sent passages are talking about him coming from heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the problem with that thesis is is that that language is so often used in prophetic um, commissioning right, right. that prophets are, say I am sent, I am sent. You know, just because there's angels that say it too doesn't definitively argue the preexistence of Christ from those texts. I mean, you'd have to connect it with a lot of other ideas. And and I think one of these ideas is this title, Son of the Most High, because only this only the demons or the spirits call Jesus that and it's after his baptism when he receives the spirit and so this notion that they they know who this son of most high which the hebrew equivalent son of el elyon which is the title of the chief of the council mm-hmm. so the which is yahweh the 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 chief of the council there's all these other beings and they know this kind of secondary figure, call him the angel of Yahweh, call him Yahweh's wisdom, call him Yahweh's name. You know, you develop this, uh, this in your book a lot of, of mm-hmm. the name and the wisdom, which you have great sections on that. But that figure, the council knows this figure. The council, yeah. know, the, 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 the beings in that spiritual realm, the unseen realm, uh, already know this figure. And so when that title is used by those spirit beings to address Jesus, I think that is a good, uh, a good, a good concept of his um, pre-existence. And not only that, uh, I think I would like to explore that more and research that more. But not only that, there's something very interesting connected to that title as well, where you get this idea that it's not just Jesus experiencing this glorification and deification, but it's actually the believers as well. And Jesus actually, I think, in Luke's Sermon on the Plain gives us an idea about this because he says, after he gets through a moral discourse, he says, you know, those that obey these rules, he says, they will be called sons of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Plural, yeah. Plural. Yeah. That they will be. This is something that is going to happen to them. And so, and, you know, you connect this idea with, and I don't have time to get into all of this, but the the short version is you connect this with the idea of, uh, say, the sermon, uh, Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, that seeing God is something that's future, that they, they will see God and live. You know, and this is an Old Testament concept. You know, if you see God, you die. H- humans, creatures, if you even set foot on the mountain, you're toast. You don't see God and live. But in the Old Testament, say examples like Exodus 24. Yeah, unless and, you're invited and all yeah, that. Yeah, You have to be invited up the mountain and you see God and you live and you, you're actually in some sense, in his heavenly temple, as if you were part of the council and you eat with him. And not surprisingly, Jesus is hosting miraculous feast and saying that they will be called sons of the Most High. So I think this is early Jesus tradition that's looking forward to this deification of the true sons of Israel, the true sons of God, who will one day usurp these um, spirit beings who, you know, when when Jesus sends out the 70, they come back saying that we have authority over these beings. Yep, yep. Um, So it's it's a, it's a, it's just a for it's a good foretaste, you know, and and of course right. the theological messaging there is pretty clear. If you have you know the Deuteronomy thirty two worldview in in your head, I mean, you, it's those aren't dots that are hard to connect. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm curious, you know, with the sending thing, because uh, you're obviously the, the the text you just referenced deal with sonship. Of course, then there's the aspect of mission. You know, why was why was this son that sent? Mm. And you get into all that. But have you looked at or considered yet uh, Isaiah nine uh, five nine five nine six? I guess it's nine five in particular in, in the Septuagint versification. That passage in the Septuagint. You know, we're familiar with wonderful Counselor. You know, mighty God, Prince of Peace, and all that. Handel's Messiah. But the Septuagint doesn't say any of that. I'm just wondering if you've if you've looked at that because what the Septuagint says there is the the, the figure you know the, the quote unquote messianic figure there is called Megales Bules Angelos you know the the messenger of the Greek oh yes so, I'm looking at it right now yeah so so there you have a clear I think so, you have a clearer yeah, message wow. you know messenger 
idea and you have a direct explicit counsel reference there and and that you know, i think pretty easily suggests pre-existence but I'm, I'm just wondering if you could tie that in at some point because that's an interesting passage you, you can't what you're going to find when you get into that is there's no mechanical explanation in terms of textual criticism mm. you, you can't really get there so that he either has a different text or it's a very again uh, interpretive rendering possibly Wait. based on you know some other you know, concatenation of traditions that, you know, wind up expressing that idea in the Septuagint. Yeah, that's, um, you know, I have in the past with uh, Daniel Street, I had, uh, we had we had done a seminar, just me and one other student with him on early Jewish and uh, monotheism and Christology. And this is one of the passages um, that we looked at. And I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember some of those conversations now, but that's something I definitely need to look into in tying that concept in with the with the Jesus tradition. And I just haven't done that yet, but that's, yeah, that's fascinating. I definitely have to look into this. Well, we should, we should wrap this up. We've, you, you've given us an hour and we're, we're grateful for that. Again, the, the purpose here is just to get people exposed to you mm-hmm. uh, that, so that a, they know that Mike isn't the only one. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, He's not the there, only one that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> there are other people out there that are quite a ways into this and, Again, we we run into each other at academic conferences and whatnot, and we sort of, you know, eventually you kind of find each other because people wind up in in the same sessions and talking about the same things and Mm -hmm. Q&A, that kind of thing. You you start to to sort of pick up on where people are at and how much they're tracking on different things. And I just think it's useful to have, uh, have the audience exposed to somebody else that sees so much of this and is really making it uh, a pursuit. And in your case, you know, really trying to deliver, you know, some of the content, you know, to uh, people who aren't as geeky as us. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) Yeah. So thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, this was a great, great discussion. I believe I can speak for all our listeners that this episode, and I just popped some popcorn, sat back and just soaked it in. This is (laughs) is good stuff. No, it's, it's a, it's a treat to hear two guys like y'all talk about this content and we certainly appreciate it. And, and, and Dave, before you go, I can't resist um, to getting yeah. up on Mike, but are you a Dallas Cowboys fan? <laughs> I'm not an NFL fan at all, actually. Okay. So, I, I'm so you, don't, you don't, you don't want to be in our fantasy. League. <laughs> well, no, I, I was just, my point is since Mike's a Packer, you know, I was just going to ask if you think Des Bryant caught that ball. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, because I'm in Dallas and I'm on a national podcast, I'll say that he did. Okay, good. <laughs> good. I, I, I guess I'll go ahead and guess... release the podcast because otherwise I was yeah. going to have to delete. <laughs> yeah. That's probably have the Dallas answer. Cowboys fans with uh, pitchforks coming at you. Yeah. No, Dave, uh, what about your church you're associated with? Would you like to tell people in the DFW area? Maybe they can come and check you out. I mean, if you're spending three years on Luke and you have QA nights, that's a church I'd like to go to. Yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's not in the DFW area. It's uh, actually up north. I'm a bivocational pastor, so uh, I it's up right near the Red River on the Oklahoma border. Really, Arthur City is right outside of Paris, Texas, wow, okay. um, and like just a little country church. And I've tried to stay faithful to that because a lot of folks that I see uh, going into church ministry at a seminary, you know, they get the little church and they work their way up kind of deal. And and I've tried to stay faithful. I've been at that church for five and a half years. And uh, I commute every weekend from Dallas, which is long, but I, I love them. And I and during the week, I work at Dallas Seminary Book Center. So oh, well, great. Do you have a website or blog or in Twitter that people can find you and learn more about you? Yeah, you can. Uh, I keep in touch with a lot of scholars and friends on Facebook. Just you can Facebook me at David Burnett. Um, you'll find me. I'm the bald guy, so it's hard to miss. Um, uh, I'm friends with Mike Heiser, so you can find me through him. And uh, yeah. I do. I do have a biblio blog called "The Time Has Been Shortened," and uh, we have not kept that up. Uh, me and a couple other good friends. It started it years ago, and we really, you know, when you get into research and you're pastoring and you're working, if we if it's not quality content we don't want to put it on there so we just kind of backed off the blogging thing for a little bit i use it to put out news and i'm probably going to start it up again soon but but facebook is probably the best way to contact me and uh you can email me at uh dburnett51 at yahoo.com just kind of my general mailbox you can send stuff if you'd like and uh, i'd love to talk more with y'all about it and anyone who's interested in my research i'd love to talk about it and so are you on twitter 
Um, I never use Twitter. I'm more of a Facebook person, but uh, yeah, Facebook's the best way to do it. I have a Twitter, but if you send me something on Twitter, I'm probably not going to see it because I don't check it often. So okay, well, we certainly appreciate you taking the time to do the show, and uh, you know, we look forward to having you back on. Oh yeah, absolutely. I look forward Uh, to it as well. Thanks, guys. I'll, I'll see you in November. Yep, we'll see you in November. I got another yep. paper on Luke 22, so you got to be there. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, Mike. Well, next week we'll be doing our fifth Q&A, and I just want to remind everybody that uh, we're answering those questions as I get them. So just please know that eventually we will get to your questions. And then after that, Mike, we're going to jump into Leviticus. That'll be exciting. Yep, that's correct. Uh, the, every, I know everyone's just pining away, you know, just clamoring, you know, to, to study Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's going to be intense. You're, you're going to get what you didn't ask for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it personally. All right. Yeah. Well, we would like to thank our guest, David Burnett, for joining us this week. And I'd like to thank everyone for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.